Hi there, Smart Drivers. Rick with Smart Drive Test talking to you tonight about defensive driving and space management, the final frontier, the very thing that will keep you safe and greatly reduce your chances of being involved in a crash. Stick around. We'll be right back with that information. Hi there, Smart Drivers. Welcome back. Rick with Smart Drive Test talking to you tonight about more defensive driving. Spock 3, which I went over last week and talked to you about. Uh, social driving, space management, speed management, observation and communication. And if you know those tenants, that will keep you safe. And not tenants like people who rent your house from you, but tenants as in the principles of defensive driving. So Ben is here. Hello, my friend. DC is here. Margaret is here from Brooklyn. Uh, Bricks for Wheels, that's Corey. Corey is the moderator, keeps the bad people out and also uh, gets the videos up that I suggest that you have a look at for further detail uh, in terms of learning how to drive and those types of things. So Rocky's here uh, from Windsor. I'm back. How are you? We're excellent. Uh, <laughs> ben says he's not a big fan of driving in the snow. And as well, these techniques of space management will also keep you safe driving in the snow. As we know, the kind of two to three second following distance that they advocate for drivers in all the handbooks is under ideal road conditions. So as road conditions deteriorate, you know, it gets dark, uh, there's more traffic, uh, different configurations of vehicles, the weather deteriorates, you've got snow and wind and ice and those types of things, then you want to increase your following distance so that you're keeping yourself safe. Uh, and this will work in any, uh, any tra any conditions so know that uh, okay and margaret says that their the driving school is keeps canceling and postponing her driving lessons because of the snow there on the eastern seaboard that they're experiencing there they seem to be getting <laughs> pelted a lot more than usual for most people naz how are you my friend clive hello and lots of people here so essentially i just want to remind everybody that the presentation will be kind of 12 to 15 minutes at most and then the remainder of the hour will be spent answering any questions you have about any aspect of passing a driver's test any aspect of starting a career as a truck or bus driver or being a safer smarter driver so essentially talking to you about defensive driving and whatnot uh anwar bc is semi in lockdown not quite uh there are a lot of shops and whatnot um closed and whatnot it's more of a shutdown than it is a lockdown but restaurants are still open and, and some exercise uh, equipments and those types of things so we're not in a complete lockdown like Ontario and Quebec are but we are shut down to a certain extent here uh, however there is hope on the horizon <laughs> maybe this week with the super cold weather that we're going to get here in British Columbia and the western uh, on the western states, the prairie provinces, the Midwest, uh, in the U.S., uh, perhaps that'll kill some of the coronavirus for us and whatnot. So, all right, uh, slideshow. Just getting over to my stuff here, and uh, yeah. So, without further ado, we'll get over here to this. <laughs> yes, driving is very empowering, Ben. There's no doubt about it. I mean, I've spent my whole career doing this, and you know, truck driving and those types of things. So, it's really great. Katie, I'm having trouble practicing driving. I'm having trouble staying in the right lane when I drive on the street. Uh, Katie, uh, we'll just we'll talk about that further after I do the presentation here, and then I'll address that for you specifically. Okay, just remind me after I get done here. All right, defensive driving, space, the final frontier. As I talked about last week, I'm hanging this on the coattails of Star Trek, uh, named after Spock. Spock three is the defensive driving model that I've proposed. And space is the final frontier. It is the fundamental tenet of defensive driving. If you can manage space around your vehicle, particularly and most importantly in front of your vehicle, you are going to greatly reduce your chances of being involved in a crash. And of course, this ties in with the other uh, three principles of defensive driving, uh, speed management, observation, and communication. So keep all of those in mind. All right, for those of you who may be new to Smart Drive Test, tuning in tonight in the live stream or watching on the replay, uh, I was a truck driver in the 1990s. Uh, as it says at the top, my name is Rick August. Uh, while I was going to university in Australia at the University of Melbourne, I was driving buses for Greyhound there and also drove for one of the regional bus lines there as well. So I have bus experience as well. 
Uh, became a licensed commercial driving instructor in 1998. Uh, actually, that should be 1997. Uh, graduated with my doctorate in legal history in 2006, which is a study of policing, courts, and prisons. My expertise is in policing as it relates to traffic, oddly enough. And if you want to see more about my about me, read more about me, you can see the complete autobiography over at the Smart Drive Test website. So it's smartdrivetest.com slash Rick August PhD autobiography and you can just find that on the on the first page there. Just scroll down and you'll find my autobiography. So new video this week, how to stop complete, completely. This is for obviously for learner, brand new learner drivers who are learning how to drive and just getting going. And it's mostly about learning how to stop completely at stop signed intersections two-way and four-way intersections and also know that the right-of-way rules are different at those two configured intersections. So have a look at that if you're having difficulty knowing exactly when the vehicle is stopped. Also in the video I say I don't agree with other driving instructors who say stop and then count to three. Uh, it's You're too long at the intersection. You need to know when the vehicles in fact stop. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> just at the end of the video when I was finishing up somebody pulled out in front of me at an intersection so have a look at the end of the video to see that and see how you deal with other people uh, pulling out in front of you all right so what is defensive driving in the American Society of Safety Engineers in 2006 defined defensive driving as driving to save lives time and money in spite of the conditions around you and the actions of others and this is very much in keeping with the definition of what a professional driver is, what a smart driver is, according to here on the channel. Essentially, other people are going to commit unpredictable actions in front of you. It's not a matter of if it's going to happen, it's a matter of when it's going to, be ha when it's going to happen, and you're simply going to put in place habits, skills, and techniques that are going to keep you safe on the roadways. And it may not be tomorrow, it may not be six months from now. It may not be 10 years from now. It may be 12 years from now. Because as tra traffic safety experts, we also know that most motor vehicles only crash once every 14 years. So the chances of it happening may be a long way off for you. So know that these habits and skills need to be developed over a period of time. They need to be maintained. And if they are maintained, they're going to keep you safe. The World Health Organization in 2004, so that we're looking at almost 18 years ago now, 16, yeah, 17 years ago, uh, worldwide an estimated 1.2 million people are killed in road crashes each year and as many as 50 million are injured. Uh, projections indicate that these figures will increase by about 65% over the next 20 years unless there is a commitment to prevention. And Vision Zero is one of those commitments to reduce traffic fatalities to zero. I don't think it's a reality, but it's a possibility. We can reduce traffic fatalities. However, reducing the number of injuries and the number of crashes that we have on our roadways, that in and of itself is something that is almost nigh impossible because you put people in a moving vehicle, you put people moving at a very high rate of speed, and you know I just think it's inevitable that they're going to crash. So SPOC 3, SPOC 3, social driving, space management, speed management, communication, and observation. These are the tenets of the defensive driving model that I propose. And you need to know that social driving is a social activity. People are in their nice comfy cars and they are more, at, more likely to exhibit behavior that they're not normally going to exhibit if they met you face to face on the street okay so they're going to give you the finger they're going to get angry they're going to be aggressive and they're going to do things that they normally wouldn't do if they were just standing in front of you so know that that they are going to commit unpredictable actions and those unpredictable actions are going to happen and it's not a matter of if it's a matter of when as i've already said previously okay space management is the most important commit uh, component of this if you can manage space you're going to greatly reduce your chances of being involved in a crash and hanging on to star trek as we have been the final frontier space and space is the most important thing with this defensive driving model and you control space by controlling your speed you communicate effectively with other road users because it is a social activity and you control space by observing properly 
with your scanning patterns in a forward motion, when you're changing lanes, shoulder checking, and when you're reversing. And all of that will keep you safe and allow you to manage space around your vehicle. So essentially you wanna have what the Smith Space Cushion System almost 70 years ago proposed as a living room. And I say to new drivers, drivers that I'm teaching that you can always, always, always manage the space in front of your vehicle. So you should have a two to three second following distance under ideal conditions. If road conditions deteriorate, then you want to increase that. If you're stopped in a queue, a lineup at, in traffic, then you wanna stop back behind the vehicle in front of you so that you can see the tires of the vehicle in front of you making clear contact with the pavement. And you cannot go at a traffic light until the vehicle in front of you goes. It doesn't matter if the light's green. If that vehicle in front of you is not moving, uh, then you can't go. And you always wanna be able to see the tires making clear contact with the pavement, even when you're driving slowly. If your attention wanes, which it will, then that way you will continue to be safe. On highways, drive between the clusters of vehicles. If you drive down a highway and you see other vehicles, you'll notice that they're always driving in clusters for whatever reason. <laughs> and people have all kinds of theories about this. It's just the way that it happens. And you know, some driving instructors, I've heard them say in the past that it's some sort of herd mentality or whatnot, but it's, it's always going to be happening. And if you get vehicles tracking you on the side, for example, they're driving at the same speed, you should be uncomfortable. Simply take your foot off the throttle, let them get in front of you and then pull them behind them and then regain, reestablish that two to three second following distance behind them, all right? So speed management will allow you to control space. So space management is number one and then speed is the second one, okay? So who's driving the vehicle? If you are following too close to the vehicle in front of you, you now have given up all ability to react in a controlled manner. You're now relying on the person in front of you to drive your vehicle. So if you manage space well and you have a two to three second following distance minimum, you're now driving your vehicle, not the person in front of you. If you're tailgating the person in front of you, you're hoping on a song and a prayer that you can react fast enough if they jam on the brakes or something like that or make an unpredictable move or whatnot. And so therefore you're giving up autonomy and you're allowing the vehicle in front of you to, dr to drive your vehicle. So don't do that. It's the same thing as somebody's tailgating you. The way that you control that space behind you is by increasing your space in front of you and then doing nice easy braking, nice easy turns, good communication, communicating well in advance and those types of things and that will keep you safe. So you want to have predictable actions. The more that you can be predictable according to the road rules, the road laws, and the culture of driving, because every region and district has a culture of driving, then you are going to be safer on the roadways. And what I mean by culture of driving is that some places will do U-turns, for example, at intersections, you'll see it all the time. Arizona, for example, but here where I live in British Columbia, uh, you rarely see any driver do a U-turn. And so that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about culture of driving. Okay, so stopping in traffic, and I've talked about, just referred to this previously, okay, it's going to prevent you being rear-ended because of you sitting at in the queue at the line of traffic. You're going to be looking in your rear view mirror. You're gonna be watching the vehicles come up behind you. You're gonna make sure that they're coming to a stop. Uh, if the vehicle in front of you breaks down, you can move out around that. If you change your mind, you can get out into the other lane without backing up. And if the vehicle in front of you, for those of you in Europe or driving manual transmissions, if the vehicle in front of you rolls backwards, which sometimes happens if you're on a hill or whatnot, then there's enough space behind you and you in front of it that it's not gonna uh, back off. And the last thing is, is that to reduce congestion and to improve traffic flow, if everybody stayed back so they could see the tires of the vehicle in front of them at an intersection when they're stopped in traffic, then the whole group of traffic could move off at the same time without having to wait for the vehicle in front of you to go and then you go and the next vehicle goes and whatnot. So those are all of the benefits of stopping so you can see the tires of the vehicle in front of you making clear contact with the pavement. All right, so predicting traffic patterns, looking farther down the ro road at controlled intersections, determining what kind of intersection it is, mapping the road users at it, looking for the turning lanes. You're looking for road uh, rubberneckers and anything out of the ordinary. When I say anything out of the ordinary, for example, me standing on the side of the road filming <laughs> for my YouTube channel, 
I get a lot of people who are distracted and wondering what I'm doing and looking at me while they're driving by. If there's a police officer with a car pulled over, that's a distraction along the side of the roadway because people are looking and going, oh, thank God it's not me who got a speeding ticket. You know, and it's if it's me driving by, I'm going, oh, Smokey the Bear got himself a customer. So anything out of the unusual is a distraction for you driving. Okay, knowing the characteristics of vehicles and road users, for example, you want to increase your following distance behind motorcycles because they have more maneuverability, they brake faster, and they accelerate faster. So you want to keep a bigger distance between you and a motorcycle. All right, and then think of the different seasons of the year. Winter time, for example, there are less vehicles out and people are driving more cautiously because there's snow and ice on the roadways and those types of things. Spring and summer, there's motorcycles and bicycles and those whatnot, those types of vehicles out on the roadway. Summertime, we get RVs and pulling people pulling recreational trailers and boat trailers and those types of things. So think of the different seasons of the year. What time are you on the roadway? Are you traveling through an urban area with lots of bars and it's 10 o'clock at night or 11 o'clock at night and there may be, you know, people who are drunk out walking around or potentially people who are driving their cars drunk. So interpret the actions of other road users. Look farther down the road. Interpret the vehicle's movements. So you're looking farther down the road. You just saw a vehicle that was parallel parking. There's a good chance that if the vehicle just parallel parked, that the driver is going to get out of the vehicle and open the door. So you need to be farther than one meter or three feet from that vehicle as you go past because the driver could potentially step out in front of you when they're exiting the vehicle. So pay attention to your, dri your driving, manage your space, and map and track other road users. Okay, and this is essential, especially important at intersections so mapping intersections locating intersections mapping the intersection what kind of intersection is is it a simple intersection is it a complex intersection does it have turning lanes does it have left turning lanes right turning lanes advanced screens those types of things all right look for the road users who are at the intersection and then track those road users who are potentially going to cross your path of travel all right so where is the intersection? What time of the day it is? As I mentioned previously, if you're going through an intersection at night, at midnight, and there's a lot of bars, and you know, here in British Columbia where marijuana has recently become legal, lots of cannabis shops and restaurants and those types of things, people are gonna be driving, they could be inebriated, people could be walking, taxi cabs, is there a taxi stand? transit buses, those types of things. So you're looking for all of this and you're mapping that and calculating which one of these road users could potentially cross your path of travel. So scan the intersection before entering. You're also looking for red light runners and those types of things. So lots of information there in a little bit of space and uh, we'll answer any questions that you have about defensive driving, passing a driving test, or starting a career as a truck or bus driver. So good luck on your driver's test and remember, Pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. And we'll get back over here. So lots of people here. My friend Tim is here uh, from DriveSmart BC. If any of you are in the province of British Columbia here, Tim has an excellent website on legislation, road rules, the culture of driving, which I talked about before. Awesome discussions over there. So if you wanna know anything about road rules, the law, check out uh, Tim's website, DriveSmart BC and uh, get involved over there for sure. Curious, where do you stand on lane filtering? So uh, Tim, define lane filtering for me because I not, I haven't heard that term before, lane filtering. All right, uh, Tim says, there is nothing wrong with slowing down. Being safe is better than being first. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the other thing about slowing down, as I've said again and again, the way that you control space around your vehicle and in front of your vehicle is by managing your space, letting off the throttle and those types of things. And coming back to space management, the top three reasons for crashes are failing to yield, and following too close. So those two right there will be taken care of with space management and the last one is speeding. But when people say speeding, that's, that's a lot more difficult to define and conceptualize because if we say, oh, speeding causes crashes, uh, well, there's lots of people who drive on the Autobahn, and there's no speed limit on the Autobahn, 
There's lots of interstates in the US that have 65, 70, 80 mile an hour speed limits, but we don't have higher number of crashes. We have a speed limit here in British Columbia of 120 kilometers an hour, which is almost 70, 73 miles an hour, but we don't have higher numbers of crashes. We have higher numbers of crashes in cities. Now, yes, <laughs> they are more fatal because there's more energy in the vehicle at higher speeds, but we don't have higher numbers of crashes because of speeding. So speeding is very difficult to nail down and there's been a number of academic papers written on that. But the first two, we'll come back to them. Failing to yield. And the, the best example that I can come up with in terms of failing to yield is drivers on freeways and there's people trying to merge out and they're like, I got the right of way and I'm not moving over and I'm not slowing down. That's failing to yield. That's simply failing to partake in the activity, in the social driving activity and you know just being a nice person and letting other people in. It's like, Arr! Well, if you're, uh, you're not gonna be a good driver and there's a good chance you're gonna be involved in a crash. The other one is following too close because as I say again and again, if you're not near anything, it's less likely you're going to hit something. So that's what I'm talking about. Oh, okay. So Tim, your motorcycles moving between slower or stop four wheeled vehicles. Uh, the term that I've heard is lane splitting. I haven't heard lane filtering. Uh, Tim, I'm not crazy about it, but again, that's a perfect example of driving culture that in Britain, I know in Britain they do lane filtering or lane splitting, and I know in California, and there'd be some other smart drivers out there, leave a comment down in the comment section if you've got this lane filtering lane splitting where motorcycles will move up between lanes of parked cars at not parked cars but stop cars stop traffic at intersections and then wait between the lanes and then when the light turns green they proceed first so just let let us know down in the comments there or in the live stream here and uh uh so yeah just know that lane filtering that's very much part of the driving culture, as I said about U-turns. We don't have U-turns in British Columbia, but they have that very much as part of the driving culture in other places. So Tim is saying, yes, we did have speed problems. Some 120 kilometer an hour zones were rolled back because of increased crash speeds. And you know, Tim, that's not, that's not surprising here in British Columbia. I mean, we have some roads that are designated highways and they just flip this, the speed limit up to 120 and there's no way that you should be driving 120. It's the same thing in Australia on the Great Ocean Road. The Great Ocean Road is 90 kilometers an hour uh, and it's 55 mile, which is 55 miles an hour. There are sections of the Great Ocean Road that you cannot drive 90 kilometers an hour on. And the other piece of that is, is that motorcycles, motorcycle riders love the Great Ocean Road in Victoria, Australia. And in the summertime, you know, Jan late December, January, February, early March, they're probably picking up three or four motorcyclists a week off the Great Ocean Road because there's just they're driving too fast for the conditions of the roadway because it's just windy up and down like this along the ocean. And it's the same thing with some of the roads uh, here in British Columbia. I mean, these are these are mountain roads. These are not designed for driving 100 kilometers and 120 kilometers an hour. So. Uh, you know, I can see why they rolled some of the speed limit limits back. That certainly makes sense. Uh, Cole, I learned a lot from you about social driving. February is my first year anniversary for passing my license. It took me three tries and I'm thankful for everything I had to learn from failing. It can save your life. And awesome, that is just a great note, uh, Cole. I'm so glad that you stopped back and let us know that February is your one year anniversary. That is absolutely brilliant. That's very, very exciting. And you know, social driving, it is exactly what you said about, uh, you know, it is social driving. It's a social activity that has its own kind of set of rules, uh, you know, predictability, and uh, it has its own culture and you gotta figure all of that out. So there's a, there's a big learning curve for new drivers in the first year to keep yourself safe and not uh, be involved in a crash. Uh, Tim, given how much attention some drivers pay, I think that it's a bad idea. Uh, uh, Tim, you think it's a bad idea that we have 120 km oh, 120 km an hour speed limit, or that we rolled the speed limit back? Um, 
Tyson, I had a really close call today. Somebody ran the red light and just about smashed into me, but I was paying attention and swerved. Uh, we're happy to hear that you're okay, Tyson, and that it was just a learning experience for sure. And glad to hear that you were paying attention and didn't get involved in a crash. MM, first, thanks for your great work. Awesome. What is the best attitude to deal with a four-way uncontrolled intersection? Uh, excellent question. I did a video two weeks ago, and Corey will put that up for you on four-way stops and how to deal with four-way stops. That'll definitely help you out. You want to, uh, I was told by a driving instructor that I'm not getting any nice awards out in the street by letting people go. I'm from Pennsylvania. <laughs> of course the driving instructor is going to say that to you. But, you know, you know, it doesn't take any time out of your, out of your day to be nice to people, that's for sure. Uh, Tyson, what was the closest call I ever had? Uh, let me let me give that some thought and then just remind me, Tyson, because I've had some close calls in my time, that's for sure. Uh, <laughs> uh, I had one a couple of weeks ago, actually. <laughs> wasn't no, it wasn't a close call because it didn't really didn't phase me. I just went out of uh, just went out of um, just went out of went for a little spin on some black ice which was kind of fun. Clive, uh, well, coming off 100 kilometer, going on to the ramp at 40 kilometers, when do I slow down to meet the required speed limit? All right, so Clive, uh, you, Corey will put the video for you on freeway merging and know that there's a deceleration lane and then there's the off ramp. The off ramp is the piece of road that's the transition from the highway off onto the other road that you're going to get off onto when you get off the freeway or interstate. But the deceleration lane on the left side will have continuity lines and continuity lines are half as long and twice as wide as normal lane separation lines and those uh, continuity lines when the continuity lines end on your left side the continuity lines means that the line the lane that you were in is either going to exit or end so in the case of a deceleration lane it's going to exit right when that stops going, when that goes from dotted to solid, then you're on the off ramp. Once you get onto the off ramp, that's when you should be down to the recommended speed limit for the off ramp. But know that the recommended speeds on the off ramp are cautionary signs. So you don't necessarily need to be right down to that speed, but they do put those down there. And for any of you who are new CDL drivers or bus drivers and you're not really sure uh, how fast you should go around the, the curve or off ramp or on ramp get down to the to that posted cautionary speed limit that'll keep you safe when you're going around there in your big truck even if, for those of you who might be driving pickup trucks with uh, re recreational trailers on them get down to that cautionary speed so you keep yourself safe when you're going around the corner okay all right uh richard i passed my g however i never stopped watching you rick you're an amazing guy and thank you rich for that that's awesome that's just an awesome compliment and uh it's really great to be part of this smart driver community and helping you out and let me tell you i have learned a lot from you as well in in the last five years and uh you know not just about you know how to make videos and run a youtube channel but also about driving i've learned heaps about driving and i've become uh, a much much better driving instructor and teacher through your questions and comments uh that you've put forth here on the channel so thank you for that as well uh eminem where can you make a u-turn in general and what is the best way to make a u-turn when you miss the road uh eminem uh sometimes it's not the u-turn is not your best option sometimes the best option is just to go around the block and come back and the have a look at the video Corey will put the video up on u-turns for you and that'll really give you the best information that you want in terms of making a u-turn and uh eminem where are you in in the world because the u-turn rules and regulations might be a little bit different for you depending on where you are dc is it 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 a good idea to hit the brake if I understeer. Uh, if you understeer. So when you say understeer, you're talking about you turn the, the wheels and the vehicle continues to go straight. If you're trying to turn, if you're doing understeering, so understeering is when you turn the wheels and the vehicle continues to go straight. Oversteering is when you turn the wheels and the back end comes around. That's oversteering. So if you're talking about understeering and that's what happens, 
and you're still wanting to turn, like you're not going into a curve. Yes, you want to get your speed down, but if you're trying to turn a corner, just abort. Just abort. Just go past and then come back. That's your best thing. Okay, so Toronto. Okay, so you're in the Sudbury m and there in terms of doing U-turns. So essentially you want to do U-turns anywhere it's going to be kind of safe, okay? You don't want signs that prohibit it. Uh, you know, you can do it at intersections. Uh, I've seen people do them at intersections quite safely. Uh, the thing about U-turns and this video here that Corey's put up, thanks for putting that up, Corey, uh, will give you kind of where you should do U-turns and where you shouldn't do turn U-turns. And just kind of a general rule, if you've got that little voice in your head that says, hey, I shouldn't do a U-turn here, then listen to the little voice in your head and don't do it. Sometimes it's just easier just to go around the block. So, you know, just go up to the next intersection, make a left, a couple of lefts and come back to where you are as opposed to trying to make a U-turn. All right. Uh, because got my license last week and still watching and that's awesome you want us. Uh, so glad that we can help out. Rocky, well, it's 9.30, so please excuse me. Uh, this means I have to get to bed now. I better not be late for homeschool tomorrow. <laughs> That's funny, Rocky. Uh, well, good night, my friend, and enjoy yourself there in Ontario. My, I was talking to my mom in Wingham, Ontario, and she said that they have tons and tons of snow there. <laughs> so I can understand what's going on there. Uh, ben says, yeah, I, av I avoid U-turns at all costs. If possible, I go in the parking lot or a street. And yeah, and you know, it's probably for you Ben there in Minnesota and for me here in British Columbia and other places that I've driven the only place that I know of that has a U-turn culture is the southwest of the US and the only place that I know of is Tucson Arizona and that was years and years ago and if anybody is on the live stream or watching on the on the uh, replay and you're from the southwest of the US, just let us know whether you do in fact have a U-turn culture there. Or again, coming back to the question we were talking about before with Tim, uh, lane splitting. Do you do you have a culture of lane splitting, splitting in the summertime with motorcycles moving up to the front of the line of traffic stopped at the intersection? Just let us know down in the comments there. Uh, Jake, going for my class five advanced on February 26th, starting to practice now as I get stressed. <laughs> Excellent. You're going to do well and just uh, practice that, Jake. And uh, if you need any help with us, let us know over at the Smart Drive Test uh, website or you can send us an email, rick at smartdrivetest.com and we'll definitely help you out. Uh, DC, yes, there was a lot of snow and the turn was sharp. I understeered and ended up on the curb on the opposite side. But other than banging into the curb, you were okay, DC? <laughs> SPAC, how do you deal with snow and ice on hills? I'm from uh, New Jersey. Uh, so SPAC, one of the ways that you deal with snow and ice on hills, so, so going up the hill in terms of snow and ice is you want to keep the momentum going in the vehicle. And most of the vehicles that you're going to be driving, I suspect, is going to be a front-wheel drive vehicle. So as you're going up, it's going to the tires are going to spin a little bit. And so just keep your foot on the throttle. If you feel that it's starting to move sideways uh, as you're spinning going up the hill, just take your foot off the throttle and then hammer the throttle back down. What will happen is the tires will stop spinning, they'll gra grab traction, and then they'll go again. And then sometimes you're just going to have to work the throttle on and off to do that. So that's going up the hill. If you're going down the hill, you want to, if you're driving an automatic, which I suspect you are, and for all of you driving automatics on snow and ice, the shifter, if you push it forward, will drop into neutral from drive. It won't go into reverse. And the same thing if you have a column shift. If you, just, if you just push it up like that, it'll drop into neutral without going into reverse. And they're designed specifically to do that. And the reason that you want to do that is, is when you're braking on snow and ice in slippery conditions is to put the transmission into neutral and then just use the brakes to control braking and slowing down. What happens with automatic transmissions is that in drive, even after you let your foot off the throttle, there's still some residual power that's going through the drivetrain. So the brakes are working against that residual power. So you wanna disconnect the transmission 
from the engine and that way you're just braking and it will give you far more control on snow and ice especially when you're going downhill in slippery conditions and again if you're kind of doing a balancing act between keeping control of the vehicle and slowing the vehicle down and so you're probably going to have to brake the vehicle will slide a little bit let you let your foot off the brake look where you want the vehicle to go reapply the brakes and slow down again and that will help you to keep control on snow and ice and there's a video here Corey will put that up for you on five tips to stop on snow and ice and that will help you out what happens is a lot of drivers get into trouble and lose control on snow and ice when they're going downhill because what they do is they put the brake on and hold the brake on well now you've locked up all the wheels and you have no steering control so what you have to do is you have to let your foot off the throttle or off the brake rather and you have to allow the wheels to roll so that you can maintain steering control because you can't brake and steer at the same time on slippery conditions it's one or the other so you got to have this kind of back and forth balancing act between the brake and the steering okay to go downhill all right Justin hey Rick if you remember me from a month ago I passed my driver's test perfectly and that is absolutely awesome Justin congratulations on passing your driver's test and how has the driving been going since a month ago Justin that's really really awesome news on passing your driver's test there elite ninja how do I judge safe distance while taking a left turn in traffic uh, elite Corey will put the video up for you on judging gap and essentially to make a left hand turn depending on how big the intersection is and how much traffic there is you're gonna need anywhere between kind of 6 to 12 seconds to clear the intersection so by the time you move into the intersection and make your left hand turn you're gonna need 6 to 12 seconds that's gonna vary a little bit depending on what kind of car you're driving how big the intersection is you know you and your reaction time and those types of things so there's a lot of things going on what I suggest to you is as you're looking I would suggest you just go down to a busy intersection in and around where you live stand at the intersection for 15 minutes and watch the cars coming towards you and then count so you're back right and you're watching vehicles make left hand turns and you're kind of first thing you want to do is count how long does it take that car to clear through that intersection so you as soon as the person makes the left hand turn and starts to move their vehicle forward 1001 1002 1003 okay so on average it takes about six to eight seconds six to eight seconds for that vehicle to execute the left hand turn and then the next thing you do after you figured that out start looking down the road and watching the oncoming traffic and looking and then counting okay 1001 1002 1003 how long does it take that traffic to get to the intersection and once you do that you do that little exercise for 10 to 15 minutes just go down and stand at the intersection it's going to help you incredibly with making your left hand turns when you're actually in the vehicle and doing it yourself so just go and do that little exercise and it's the same thing for anybody who's learning how to drive anybody who is going to be doing four-way stops or those types of things just go down to the intersection I know it sounds goofy but it works go down and count the time and those types of things and that'll really help you out Justin with all this COVID regulations I've only been able to drive twice to get materials from school but it has been very simple from watching your advice videos excellent <coughs> excuse me well we're hoping <laughs> I'm hoping <laughs> that it's only another eight weeks because April's coming and April is as I've heard from friends who are in the medical profession that uh, April is the end of flu season so I'm really crossing my fingers crossing my fingers that that will be the end of it in April that we can start to get back to some sort of sense of normalcy in the world here okay uh, awesome so Ben saying he has good judgment and that is really good that's excellent that's a good skill to have all right see if I missed anybody if I missed your question because it's fairly busy here on the live stream tonight uh, just do it again or just give me an arrow to point up or those types of things and I'll definitely help you out 
So, Alfred, uh, the best way to down a hill with a transmission vehicle is shift to the low gear and you will have a better control downhill. Alfred, I disagree. Uh, I disagree because what you're doing is you're relying on engine braking and engine braking you don't have as much control. That is old school thinking, okay? And I'll tell you what, why that's old school thinking. The reason for old school thinking is, is that in the 1940s and 1950s, brakes were unreliable. Actually, brakes were unreliable right up until the beginning of the 1970s. And because brakes were unreliable, drivers learned to shift down. Your grandfather learned to shift down. Your dad learned to shift down. And unfortunately, even though technology has advanced, we still have these old ways of thinking about driving. And so lots of people still think that shifting down is the best way to brake. It's not, and it's certainly not on slippery conditions because you don't have as much control as you would with the braking. You're relying on engine braking. Now, let me just add a caveat to that. The caveat to that is, is that if you are downhill braking for a long distance and you have a heavy load or a truck or those types of things, then yes, you need to engine brake. You need to use the auxiliary brake to go down the hill. I'm just talking about regular braking and those types of things. Use the brakes don't use the drivetrain okay and there's another video here um so corey put the video up on safe gap there awesome thanks corey and the other video on downshifting a manual transmission i talk about this why would you use a fifteen thousand dollar drivetrain to save four hundred dollar brakes because that's essentially the world that we live in now most passenger vehicles are kind of five hundred to eight hundred dollars to change a set of brakes on it the drivetrain which consists of you know <laughs> the transmission, the engine, the, the rear differential, the front CV joints and those types of things is like $15,000. Why would you use the drivetrain? And as well, you don't have as much control with the drivetrain. So you have much more control with the brakes. So use the brakes because they're less expensive to replace and you have much more control with them. And it's very unlikely that brakes are going to fail in this day and age. Like, 99.5% unlikely they're gonna fail. Because as I've talked about in the air brake course, this also applies to hydraulic brakes on your regular passenger vehicle. If you pop the hood on your car, the master cylinder is on the firewall. It's at the back of the engine compartment, uh, right in front of the steering wheel. That's where the master cylinder is. If you take the cover off the master cylinder, which is essentially the hydraulic pump for your brakes, you look in there, there's two chambers in there. And the reason there's two chambers is that the hydraulic braking system is divided into two independent systems. So if the back brakes fail, the, br the front brakes will still work because it's independent of the rear brakes or vice versa. And if the brakes completely fail, the master cylinder falls off your car or whatnot, you still have the emergency brake, which is the parking brake. Then you can apply that manual and you can bring the vehicle to a stop. So it's almost nigh impossible that the brakes are going to fail on your vehicle in this day and age okay excellent alfred thank you i'm so glad we could change your mind or at least help you out with that there and let give you some information about <laughs> tim saying uh <laughs> okay so tim uh, i was taught that you go down the hill in the same one that you went up it in yeah and tim you know something in air brake courses that thinking still exists but you and I both know, Tim, that here in British Columbia, one of the problems with that thinking is, is that you go down the hill and the same one that you went up the hill is, a lot of times you don't go up the hill to go down the hill. And, that, and a perfect example of that is driving north here on Highway 97C from Vernon up to Kamloops. Just before you get to the Trans-Canada, uh, Mount Monte Creek Hill, well, you don't go up a hill to go down a hill. You just come along on the flat and then all of a sudden you go downhill. So you don't really know what gear you should be in. <laughs> and Tim says he's not that old yet. Well, I'm not that old yet either. But, and the other thing, and I'll just say this, I used to be of the same thinking. I used to think that you geared down to slow down and then, you know, I don't know, about 10 years ago driving truck, somebody was in the truck with me one day and they said, well, what are you doing? <laughs> like, what are you talking about? What am I doing? I'm slowing the truck down. And they're like, just use the brakes, man. <laughs> Actually, I think he I think he owned the truck. I think he was part of the the trucking company, and he's just use the just use the brakes, man. 
<laughs> and, you know, and then I started thinking about it and then I realized, yeah, why are, why, you know, talking about your personal car, why are you using a $15,000 drivetrain to save $500 brakes? It doesn't make any sense. And as well, you have much more control with just the brakes. Okay. Uh, Cole, what does neutral do? This still confuses me. Uh, Cole, neutral disconnects the engine from the drivetrain. Okay. So you have the engine which provides power to the car and then you have the transmission and when you so in an automatic transmission you have park reverse and then drive and then you have a couple of gears below that but essentially you have you know park reverse neutral and drive those are the main gears that you're going to use in an automatic transmission a neutral gear just disconnects the transmission so that it's not in any gear and it's not locked out as it is in park and if you're braking on snow and ice on slippery conditions then you just want to pop the gear selector into neutral to disconnect the drivetrain from the engine so that you don't have any residual power pu pushing you forward it's not working against the brakes and you know other other than that neutral doesn't have a lot of purpose uh, for more information on that though Cole uh, I would suggest just have a look in your driver's manual and just have a quick glance at see what the information it says about neutral uh, that's going to be your best source of information for neutral in your particular vehicle okay and the other thing is, is if you're towing the vehicle uh, it may also have to be in neutral as well and of course that information again will be in your owner's manual Tim thank you so much it's always a pleasure when you show up and your questions are always getting me thinking and offering uh, better quality information so have a great dinner and we'll see you next week my friend Forrest uh, all right, <laughs> Corey, you can take care of that one. Uh, Apple I I E. Yes, that's yeah, that's um, <laughs> that's old school for sure. Uh, with my staff and should expect for cold conditions. Yes, we are definitely having cold conditions. We're talking about it going down to minus twenty degrees Celsius, which is I think once you get to minus twenty degrees Celsius, it's about the same as minus twenty degrees Fahrenheit. I think by the when you get down that low that the two of them start to get about the same <laughs> so it's cold for sure okay so how to downshift a manual car for anybody who wants kind of more information about downshifting to break a vehicle and not doing it and the reasons for not doing it definitely have a look at that video and that'll definitely uh, help you out for sure so just going back to defensive driving Spock 3 social driving space management speed management observation and communication spock three the three is the three s's social driving space management speed management so that's the fundamentals and i've put that on kind of the coattails of star trek to help you remember it and then space the final frontier space management is the most important component of social of space management is the most important component of defensive driving if you can manage space around your vehicle well you are going to significantly reduce your chances of being involved in a crash the other point that I didn't make about this that just came into my head is is that social driving is a social activity and we tend to do what our peers are doing when we're driving or when we're doing whatever right and Majid just asked me what social driving is. Thank you for asking me that because I kind of breezed over that. I did talk about it last week. Social driving. Some of the hallmarks of social driving are driving above the posted speed limit, not stopping completely at stop signed intersections, driving over painted islands, following too close, not signaling. Those are just a few of the hallmarks of social driving. And you can expect that when you go out into the world of social driving what I needed to say about social driving and space management is is that you're driving amongst your peers and we'll call them your peers and we'll use that term kind of loosely right and we are educated by what our peers do are doing everything in the driving environment tells us to do the exact opposite of what I'm telling you <laughs> right you speed, you follow too close, you stop too close to other vehicles in uh, in traffic, and you know the mentality of social driving is is that hurry up and get going, otherwise you're going to impede me. 
traffic flow really is kind of the biggest factor of social driving that you need to hurry up and get going otherwise you're going to get in my way and then I'm going to cuss at you and I'm going to honk my horn and I'm going to shake my fist right so it's tough for you as new drivers it's tough for all of us as drivers to go against that because everything in the social driving environment is telling us to do something different it's telling us to be as close to the vehicle in front of us as we can get it's you know and when you start hanging back and maintaining that two to three second following distance or you're sitting in the queue and you're able to see the tires of the vehicle in front of you making clear contact with the pavement you're thinking I'm too far away and it's completely opposite of what every other driver is doing in the social environment so <laughs> in the social driving environment so it's tough because I'm telling you in a in a model of defensive driving, the Spock 3 defensive driving model, to do exactly opposite, not exactly opposite, but very much opposite of what everybody else is doing. But if you watch all of my videos here on this channel, you'll see that it works very well in the way that I drive every day. And this is the way that I drive every day. Okay? Uh, ben. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, work together on roadways, Faza, exactly. My friend Epic, how are you? Uh, Northeast states like PA and New Jersey uh, leave a space when traveling with large commercial vehicles like tractor trailers and coach buses. Do they mean cars because large vehicles? Um, yeah, and it's not just big vehicles, Epic. And, you know, there's some weirdness going around driving manuals and those types of things, but we can talk about that later. Uh, ben, I have to get ready to bed now. Uh, big day for driving to work and other errands to do on the way to work. Good night, my friend. All the best and enjoy your rest. Excellent. Okay, so we got everybody here. Brilliant. Okay, so Majid, did I answer your question on social driving that you kind of understand uh, what social driving is, that it's a social activity that we're dealing with other people and other drivers? Uh, the other thing that I talked about earlier in terms of social driving and the smart drivers here on the live stream or if you're watching on the replay I mean leave a comment down in the comment section there the other thing that you can do is also talk about some of the hallmarks of social driving I've only mentioned a few of them right speeding following too close uh, not signaling not stopping completely at stop signed intersections not looking before they back up in parking lots and those types of things so you know just leave a comment down in the comment section there on some of the definitions that you have of social driving that people do that is part of the driving culture right in and around your area and those types of things and we also talked earlier about lane splitting with motorcycles moving up between stop traffic at an intersection or doing u-turns and those types of things all of that is part of driving culture it's part of social driving and whatnot uh <laughs> good night my friend uh, Kilo, uh, review lane position on winding roads. Okay, so lane positions on winding roads is, is that left to go right, right to go left. So you always want to be top side of the curve. So if you're going on a curve uh, to the left, you want to stay to the right of the curve. If you're going that way, to the right, my right, your left, then you want to stay top side. So you always want to be top side of the curve to keep yourself safe. And the other thing you can do is start top side on one side, bottom, and then out the top side on the other. If you watch racing, especially NASCAR, they're making a left turn. They do that. They come high side down to the bottom of the curve and then back out to the top side. They straighten the curve out. Corey will also put the video up for you on driving on curvy roads, and that'll give you more information on staying safe on curvy roads and those types of things. How old is the car Mega? Not I'm not sure, Ben. I'm not following any of that. Uh, Margaret, passing you on the right when you signal to make a right turn is a social driving thing here. Wow. Passing on the right. <laughs> I'll have to add that one, uh, Margaret. I, I didn't remember that from when I was in uh, Brooklyn. Uh, Mega, just bought a car and I keep stalling in traffic. So, Mega, you're driving a manual transmission. Corey will put the video up for you on... Uh, stalling and what you can do to fix that and you know or at least have less stalling I'm not saying that you're ever going to eliminate that completely I still do that every now and again so it does happen 
And Mahid speeding, yes, definitely. Uh, ben said <laughs> NASCAR is all left turns. Yes, it is. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh. Uh, I have the car checked out. Mega 2004. Okay, I'm still not following you, Ben. I thought you were going to bed. <laughs> you were going to bed, my friend. Uh, Margaret, it's happened to me a few times. Have to always check because someone is trying to cut me off passing on the right side. Okay, uh, Margaret, one of the one of the things that you might have to do is try and get your vehicle over closer to the shoulder of the road so they're not doing that, so they can't kind of squeeze in there on the inside of you. All right. Uh, Cole, I'm having trouble stopping in the snow. That's when I use the use the neutral. Yes, yes. So just pop it forward, brake, get it stopped, and then just pull it back, and it'll it'll just drop into drive. Just practice it a couple times, Cole. You'll find it's really easy after you do it a couple of times. Hossein, uh, social driving in Vancouver, BC. I see is drivers don't signal, speed on city roads, cut corners, tailgating, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yes, those are all excellent examples of social driving for sure. Uh, Spicer, I always have problems with my wife when I stop two to three vehicle lengths. She said that I should not leave so much driving distance, and I said I'm controlling space management. Uh, yeah, probably two to three vehicle lengths is probably a little bit much, Alfred. You just want to be able to see the tires of the vehicle in front of you making clear contact with the pavement, and that's about one vehicle length. You only need about one vehicle length. Two to three is probably a little bit too much, uh, so just try that and see if that works out, and then that way it'll keep your keep your wife happy too because <laughs> you know the saying right happy wife happy life <laughs> so but I, you know we like to apply that to everybody because if everybody's happy then we all have a happy life uh felix thank you rick with the good work i have never missed watching your uh live videos uh which has helped me to pass my g road test last year in november and that is awesome felix thanks so much for dropping by and letting us know and I take it that you're doing well, despite the fact that Ontario has been in lockdown since last November and you haven't really been doing a lot of driving, but you know, that is really, really awesome. Okay, so Corey's put the video up there on curvy roads. Thank you for doing that, Corey, that's awesome. Uh, I notice sometimes people don't wait for turns on stop signs. Yeah, that's true, Majid, they just come up and they have a little glance at the intersection and they go. Con, I have my L and my road tests uh, is three weeks away. I was taking my driving lesson yesterday. Instructor asked me to make a right turn and pedestrian was walking. I stopped and the guy me, behind me started honking. Yeah, you know, and unfortunately, Con, that's what people are going to do. They're just, they just seem to be in so much of a hurry. That's like, wow. But, you know, just, just put your hand up like this and then just let them go and have their crash somewhere else, right? Okay. Mola, Hajmola. Uh, I really like your video, sir, with in-depth uh, expansions and very nice camera views. And that is awesome. Thank you for letting us know. And we're so glad that we can help you out. And if you have further questions, you know, leave us a comment or drop us an email at rick at smartdrivetest.com. And anybody else, uh, pass your driver's test first time course. It's available over at the Smart Drive Test website uh, on special for $37.95 USD. And that also includes the defensive driving course and the winter driving course. And I know some of the smart drivers don't get snow. For example, if you live in Florida or you live in Arizona, places like that, Texas, parts of Texas. However, the winter driving course will help you for any inclement weather that you might be driving in. Rain, snow, sleet, fog, <laughs> ice, those types of things. So if you're interested, it's over at the Smart Drive Test website. Corey will put the link up for that as well and you can check that out over there. Okay, DC brake checks happen more often than I thought. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, DC and uh, brake checks are, you know, one of the reasons why I really advocate space management and really advocate that you're maintaining your two to three second following distance behind other vehicles. Uh, con. Okay, okay. Uh, what was the question? Oh, if, if that happens on your road test, Con, if somebody starts honking at you, uh, again, Con, one of the things that you have to do on your driver's test is just focus on what you're doing. If you know that you come up to an intersection and there's a pedestrian there waiting to cross and the pedestrian's potentially going to step out in front of you, you're doing the right thing by stopping and waiting for the pedestrian to proceed. So 
just take a breath you know whatever you do under your breath about the person behind you that's honking stop do the right thing and then carry on and proceed okay uh, Ray now I'm uh, only going to follow your advice on parallel parking or your method rather uh, okay so that's gonna help you out excellent uh, epic in the highways no drivers use space concept instead they tend to get closer to each other and lead to high-speed crashes uh, yeah and epic you're absolutely right for whatever reason on interstates parkways and highways people tend to drive in clusters and you as a smart driver want to drive in the spaces between the clusters you don't want to be up I mean sometimes it's inevitable that you're going to be in the cluster but if you can avoid it which you can most of the time especially if you are just on the highway and you put the vehicle on cruise control just you know a couple at the posted speed limit and drive in the right lane then most of the time you're going to avoid the clusters because the traffic's just going to be going past you and here's another secret of highway driving and I know this from driving truck you are going to make better time on a highway if you can maintain a constant speed as opposed to up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down okay if you can put the vehicle on cruise and you can maintain a constant speed for two hours you're going to make more time you're going to make more miles in two hours on cruise than you will going up and down and off and on and whatnot so there you go Corey's put the link up for the pasture drivers test first time course package and thank you for that Corey. anybody's interested in that you can head over there to the smart drive test website and check that out uh, Margaret, can you design a driving training video game? Actually, Margaret, <laughs> that might be coming. So we'll I'll see what I can do for you. Uh, have you checked out, Margaret, have you checked out American Trucker? <laughs> I know that's probably not going to help you out, but it is one of the suggestions I have. Uh, acceleration and deceleration in school zones. Not familiar with that. Okay, Kilo, is it okay to paint a damaged plate number? Uh, Kilo, if it's that bad then you might have to get it replaced but I can't see why not uh, Cole when there's a car that is in front of me that shows me they are unpredictable I keep my distance I think social driving means use your judgment and be practical yes uh, that's the definition Cole of defensive driving which you're talking about in terms of social driving but you know implement habits that are gonna keep you safe while you're on the roadway and driving for sure so all right, so we're at the top of the hour here, and I think we'll leave it there for tonight. And if you have any questions, you know, leave us a comment down in the comment section. Any of the questions that we talked about in terms of hallmarks of uh, definition, or hallmarks of social driving, definitions of social driving, whether they do U-turns where you live or whether they do lane splitting, leave us a comment down in the comment section as well. Hit that thumbs up button and consider subscribing to Smart Drive Test. We have a test coming up in the next couple of weeks. Good luck on that, and remember, Pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. Have a great night. Bye now.